I've been shooting high magnification macros for a while now, and as a Pentax user, my lens options have been pretty limited if I want to get really, really close. And out of necessity, I've had to improvise with reversed lenses, extension tubes, and I've gotten some great results I'm really proud of for pretty cheap, but these techniques can be kind of awkward and cumbersome in use. So, when Venus Optics offered to send a 2.5 to 5x macro lens in a Pentax mount for review, I was really excited. This was about two years ago now, and since then it's pretty much been in my backpack on every trip and bug hunt I've gone on. So, I figure now's as good a time as any to share my impressions of the lens and put together a bit more of a long-term review than usual. It's a fairly small diameter lens with a clicky aperture ring way out of the tip, um, ranging from f2.8 to f16. Around back you can see that there's eight aperture blades making for smoother, rounder bokeh. And for this review I'll be using the Laowa on a APS-C size body, a crop sensor Pentax K3. The lens extends from 82 to 137 millimeters at 5x magnification. This really is pretty small given the magnification range, especially looking back at previous options like the Canon MVE 65mm. Starting at 2.5x magnification, let's try shooting something. This Sacagawea $1 coin I got in my change in Ecuador will be a cooperative subject for a focus stack. So I'll pull out my old macro focusing rail set, which I really don't use that often since I'm usually, you know, shooting handheld out in the field, but for indoor testing purposes like this, it'll be fine. Its movements are a little bit coarse, but it'll get the job done. It's very dark through the viewfinder at these higher magnifications, so the focusing aid light of my twin flash is really helpful. Here I've got the camera and the rail mounted on a tripod, and the coin is clamped in a little helping hands jig. The 40 to 45 millimeter working distance is really pretty comfortable, and I found it easy to get used to as a handheld shooter. This is a completely manual lens with no aperture coupling and obviously no focusing ring. Um, focusing is done by moving the camera closer or further away. All right, let's take a picture and see how it turns out. Shooting at f4, one of the first things you might notice is how incredibly shallow the depth of field is, even on a relatively flat plane like this coin. But what's in focus is really, really sharp. Stacking nine shots together, you can really appreciate all the tiny scratches and dings this coin has collected in its years and years of bumping around pockets and purses. All right, let's step up the magnification and see how the lens performs at 5x. Opening up to f2.8, the depth of field is razor thin at this magnification, but the in-focus portion is beautiful, even way up here in the corner. And here's 19 shots, kind of messily stacked. Those focus gaps are my fault. I didn't shoot enough frames. Even despite this, it's clear that the lens really holds up, producing incredibly sharp images, even at the max magnification of 5x. Now, to talk about diffraction, let's take a look at the eye of Hideo Noguchi here. If you're stacking or really just wanting to pull the most detail you can out of the lens, shooting wide helps. Even open at f2.8, there's an incredible amount of detail. Stopping down will get you more depth of field, but at a cost. Uh, diffraction will overtake the image and things will get pretty soft. And this is not a fault of the lens, it's just the way things are at these really high magnifications. So let's head outside and see if we can find something to shoot. Unfortunately, it's winter at the time of filming this, but underneath this old log, there's little fungivorous things like a, uh, or a matted here. This one's a little over a millimeter long. This is why you keep a rotten log in your yard. Like, there's springtails, there's oromatids, there's millipedes, there's really small snails. There's that nice big snail there. Like, even though it's in the middle of winter, there's a whole diversity of subjects that are really good for high mag. An oromatid right up inside of a little hole right here. Where did he go? Where did he go? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there he is. He just came out of the hole. Okay, I'm going to have to get a number name on. So it's really dark through the viewfinder at 5x and at like 5.6 like this, it's stopped down enough, it's very dark. Oh, he's facing me now, I should shoot. I can find him. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Sometimes 
what I try to do is find like a pointer piece. I think this will point towards his hole. So if I can find this, then I can find him. Okay, I found it, and it's pointing right towards him. That actually helped. Taking focus stacks of this mite was not really an option given how active it was, so shooting at f5.6 was kind of a nice trade-off between uh, depth of field and sharpness. I often find myself feeling a bit pessimistic about winter. When it's cold out and everything's dead, I don't always feel like going out and looking for things to shoot macros of. But getting out and trying is often an enlightening and rewarding experience. Uh, even in the middle of winter, beautiful little things can be found. Carefully flipping over rocks or digging into logs can reveal all sorts of beautiful life. Especially if you're interested in really little things like mites, springtails, soil dwelling invertebrates. Um, this little snail was fun to watch through the lens and I didn't get that many great shots, but looking at the video later, it's cool to see um, the springtail running around the frame, that little elongate springtail, often on the snail itself. I had planned on shooting the eye stalks of the snail, but 5x magnification was a little bit too high for that. So here's an abstract of the shell. I made sure to carefully turn that rock back over and let the snail go on his way so no birds would find an easy lunch. Of course, spring will eventually return, and along with the warmer temperatures, there'll be more arthropod activity. I don't keep, breed, or buy animals, so all the jumping spiders I shoot, I find in and return to the wild. And working with active, live subjects like this guy, shooting can be tough, um, especially when your lowest magnification is 2.5x. But I found even on my crop sensor Pentax, finding and focusing on subjects isn't too bad with this lens. At least for me, the close working distance helps. Um, keeping the aperture open a bit to let in some light, I'll start zoomed out at 2.5x, and then eyeball my alignment and distance to the subject off the tip of the lens before looking through the viewfinder. And on this note of working distance, another big benefit of getting in so tight is that my flashes and flash diffuser are a lot closer to the subject, which allows for not only softer lighting, but I can dial back my flashes a bit and get faster recycle times. Also, I really appreciate the slender, narrowing shape of the lens. First, this shape's helpful for knowing where the lens is pointed when getting in tight and close on little subjects. Um, additionally, the small front of the lens is great for minimizing something I've seen called the black hole effect, where the lens creates a dark reflection in the subject because it's so close. I've used the Canon MPE 65mm macro quite a bit, and it's a fine lens in its own right, but it, it's just enormous. Telescoping out to an absurd length and its big front end causes a huge dark reflection. Uh, blocking a lot of light from illuminating the front of the subject facing the front of the lens. Now, not to keep trashing on the Canon MPE, but the Lala, aside from being less than half the price, weighs about half as much as the Canon II, which is a big deal. Most macro lenses are really sharp lenses, so I often favor the lighter option above all else. And you'll notice this weight difference too when packing and after a long day shooting outside. Obviously, no lens is perfect, um, this one included. The first drawback that comes to my mind is the lack of auto aperture control or aperture coupling of any kind. This lens is completely manual. But coming from a background of using reverse prime lenses, I'm used to this, and although it's definitely not ideal, it's not that big of an issue for me personally, but be forewarned. This does, however, make the lens simpler, cheaper, and more adaptable. Um, meaning you can get it with Canon mounts, Nikon, Pentax, Sony, and even with adapters for Fuji and Micro Four Thirds. I have seen some complaints about lens flare with this lens, as the front element is kind of exposed and out there. I personally never had much of an issue with this as I position my flashes a, a bit behind the end of the lens to avoid the possibility of flashing the front element. 
Most of my shots turn out contrasty and rich without any issue. That said, flare is an ever-present issue with macro, as you're often popping flashes right up near the end of the lens. So to wrap things up, I like this lens a lot. And after years of singing the praises of reversed primes for macro, I actually grab this lens for most of my high magnification work now. And yeah, it costs a little bit more, but the benefits are definitely worth it. If you'd really like to compare the lens's optical performance in a more scientific presentation, I've added some links to reviews by great macro photographers like John Hallman, Nikki Bay, and Gil Wizen in the comments. Aside from a few scratches on the barrel, it's holding up really well, and I hope it lasts for years to come. Any lens that allows people to get closer than ever in an affordable, accessible package is a huge leap forward, and I support it. Finally, I'd like to thank Venus Optics for sending the lens for review, and check out venuslens.net, and stay tuned for more macro videos and reviews soon.